Good evening all and welcome. The first thing I want to say is tonight has some particularly dark stories. So if you're not so inclined on that, skip to about story four and you should be just fine. Link in the description for timestamps. And again, the Patreon promo is going strong if anyone wants to sign up and get exclusive vinyl stickers, regular stickers, um, a signed letter from me addressed to you, and a whole bunch of exclusive Patreon-only content, you can follow the link at the top of the description to check that out. Thanks, guys. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I lived in Astoria, Ravenswood houses in the 90s. I was friends with the mailman who was a really cool guy. His name was Rich. What happened after New Year's was crazy and for a month I saw this man deteriorate into a killer. Rich was an all-round cool guy. He was good-looking, charismatic, and delivered the mail around our neighbourhood. His baby's mum lived in my projects in Ravenswood House, and he would say hi to everyone on Christmas no matter how poor people were, and they often left him a tip in cash. Everyone liked him. But Rich had a dark side that involved a fight where he beat his baby mama and got a restraining order. He broke her orbital bone during an argument. During that year, his girlfriend would often walk about with two black eyes or a swollen cheek. He was beating her. He did not show up for two weeks because of some departmental procedure suspending him till they found out what the case was, and I saw him two weeks later. He was much less cheery. The new year brought him a child support garnishment for his kid and legal problems, not to mention problems regarding custody. A few months passed, and I saw he had started staring into the distance in the hot sun, and did not look good. His long stares would be longer and longer, and it would take time for him to reply to his name being called. Everyone around the way heard he had broken a court order and beat his girlfriend again. He was no longer the cheery, charismatic man we knew, but something darker. He stopped saying hello to people. One day coming up from work, I see a Telemundo truck along with Eyewitness News Channel 7 and NY1 news vans. Rich killed his wife and seven-year-old and 13-year-old stepsons. Both heads were removed. The kids' genitals were found in their mouths, both of their heads in a closet. They lived two buildings down from me and my friend was their neighbor. Cops sealed off the building. He tried to cut his wrists but failed and was taken by ambulance. After detectives left the crime scene two weeks later and everything was concluded, we snuck in through my neighbor who lived next door. All the action took place in the kitchen. It was like blood was dragged from the living room to the bedroom. The bedroom had a broken door, but we didn't go inside. This was before crime scenes came to clean up. I had nightmares for weeks. For a week, the boy who lived in my building, who was seven and friend with the kids, became traumatized after he heard about his friend's death. His mother encouraged me to talk to him, since he looked up to me as a big brother. And I remember he asked me, why do people hurt children? I could only say, because they're sick in their heads. And he cried in front of me as I comforted him. From that point on, I had trouble sleeping for a while. Going in the actual murder scene made things worse. I will always remember a blank stare when I joked around with him. It was like he was staring right through me. He is currently serving three life sentences. This happened a number of years ago in early December. I was playing a mobile game for about three months prior. It's a fantastical medieval war type game where you level up your castle to get stronger troops and better defenses. And as you upgrade your buildings, it also features invading other castles after you played for more than seven days. There are alliances formed where other players team up and work together on events. You can also edit your profile and change your picture global chat, alliance chat, and private chat, and it's easily accessible to anyone. 
I got into it several months later than others. I discovered the game from an ad, and it was based off one of my favourite series, and since I've played similar games, I adjusted quickly and was recruited by one of the top alliances, which also is kind of infamous for its members being a bit too friendly with female gamers. I did use my own picture in the profile, but my hair was covering half my face, and I had an anti-dust mask on. Only my left eye was clear, and yet they still invited me. I'm not gonna lie, I had thought I might run into some pesky guys, but I still accepted anyway. It was just my third day playing, and I needed all the resources I could get to strengthen my castle, and getting into alliances is a surefire way to get donations early in game. Besides, every alliance is bound to have their rotten crops. Most of them were pretty okay, their leader was really helpful, and while he would tease the girls sometimes in chat, he would stop when we tell them to, or he would sense we were getting uncomfortable. There was a handful that were straight up thirsty jerks. One guy said that girls were inferior to him, and another offered in-game currency to any girl that wanted to cyber with him. And what particularly ticked me off was this dude was claiming I was his property, even going so far as to spam the global chat to warn other players to not flirt with me or he'll destroy them. Sheer idiocy. He's a wallet warrior, meaning a person who buys in-app purchases. That also means free players like me can't exactly fight back with him and expect to leave a dent on his castle. The leader sent me a private message and apologised on his behalf and told me he can't exactly kick the jerk out of the alliance since he was a valuable player despite his insufferable behaviour. The most I could do was block him and hope he stays in the alliance so he wouldn't attack me. He didn't, but instead he made dummy accounts and constantly sent me private chats. I was getting pissed with repeatedly blocking his accounts that I finally conceded to his condition for him to stop spamming me. That is, for me to unblock his main account. For several days he didn't talk to me that much, and when he did, he was actually polite. The leader told me he must have turned over a new leaf, but I wasn't convinced. But I didn't shut him out. That was when it got really bad. Thinking back, I may have been a bit careless when I was talking to the other players. There were female players, and I quickly bonded with them and made friends. Sometimes we'd chat in the alliance, just so that it would be lively in there. The conversations were random, but there were snippets where we wrote our information. Not the specifics, but I clearly remember saying my birth country and school I attended to. But the city, the street, the exact address, I didn't spill. So it was the first week in December, when a Christmas event was held in game. By that time I was not bothered by the jerk, and we could even hold civil, albeit short conversations. I was talking with a female player when he typed in the Alliance chat. Do you like flowers? It was a random question, but I decided to answer, I guess. A few seconds later his message popped up. Do you like surprises? Again I wasn't sure where this conversation was going, but I didn't want to appear rude. Pleasant ones, yes. My friend had to go offline, and she said goodbye and sent me a virtual hug, since we can't hug for real. It's just sort of became a greeting for the girls in the Alliance chat. I almost forgot about the jerk, but then he wrote, Hmm, you'll be moved to tears soon. See you. I'll give you more than virtual hugs. I was positively weirded out by his words, so I made an excuse to log out the game. It was nearing school break, and classes were pretty chill so I was just hanging out in the library to have some peace and quiet. But then one of the working students, i.e. a close friend, tapped me on the shoulder with a quizzical look on his face. Hey, did you snag a boyfriend without telling me? What, why'd you say that? I asked, not seeing the connection at this time. There was a bouquet of flowers sent to you. It's in the department office right now. That's when it all clicked. All the random questions. That creepy endliner he found me. I was panicking so bad to the point I had to go to the clinic and skip the rest of classes. I didn't accept the flowers, I didn't even want to see them. When I was asked what to do with the bouquet, I told them to throw them out. My username didn't even have any relation to my real name, and when I was asked for my name, I only gave them my nickname. It creeped me out how this jerk managed to find me. I was scared out of my wits and chatted to the leader about it, and he was shocked too. He then sent me screenshots of their conversation, of me, to which the jerk was doing most of the talking. 
The leader was sending clipped, dismissive responses, but the jerk didn't seem to notice. He was too immersed in his fantasies, horrible thoughts that made my skin crawl to this day. I told him I'm quitting the game and to apologize to the Alliance on my behalf. I don't want to worry the other players, so I had to make the leader tell a lie and that I was getting too busy with studies and that I had to stop playing. I don't exactly know how he tracked me down, but I spent the rest of my semester fearing for my life. I didn't go anywhere alone. Heck, I rarely hang out with my friends. Fortunately, they understood after I explained the situation, and I graduated with paranoia clinging on my back. But even now, I couldn't get myself to play any game similar to the one where I unluckily met him. I was also extra wary to guys, especially strangers. After that flower incident, I didn't get any more surprises for him, and I hope it stays that way. And as for the jerk, let's never meet again. A few years back, my friend and I were walking around the mall. We had to use the restroom, and the nearest one was this creepy isolated one towards the back. My friend would always tell me that the bathroom gave her bad vibes, but I thought she was just being paranoid. As we were heading towards the bathroom, a man passed us, giving us the creepiest stare. I turned around and noticed he was following us, so I quickened my pace and urged my friend to do the same. She was confused but obeyed, and I scanned my surroundings to see if there was a place we could hide or find a public place, but to my dismay there was only an empty back lot with a dumpster for him to potentially dispose of our bodies. I panicked and ran to the bathroom. Once inside, my friend asked me what was going on, and I explained and told her to put her weight against the door since there was no lock. A few seconds later, someone was trying to open it. I freaked out and pushed against the door so whoever it was couldn't get in. The person wouldn't budge and pushed harder. At one point, the door opened a crack and I was able to see the man pushing against the door. I freaked out and called my dad while simultaneously keeping my weight against the door. What's funny about all this is my friend not freaking out and giggled at some points. She even suggested to go hide under stools and I was so shaken up with fear and adrenaline that I called her a dumbass. Even funnier is when I told my dad, Hello dad, someone's tried to kidnap, come quickly. He was like, For real? Are you sure? Alright, you got the door? Damn, well, alright, I'm coming. Long story short, he stopped pushing, and we waited a few minutes until my dad was there. We heard a hard knock on the door, and for some reason it felt like it was safe to finally open it. It was a few girls standing there, confused, they asked if we were okay since I was crying, and I told them, and they got concerned and described the man I saw, and I asked if it was him. They only confirmed it to me. Truly scary, and I'm glad we made it out of there. I was talking to my parents recently about scary interactions I had while growing up, and they reminded me of one I've completely forgotten about. I was seven years old and very naive, and believed whatever was said to me. I got bullied quite a lot in school, therefore leaving me with little friends, and decided to join an online game, Moshi Monsters, if anyone remembers it. Basically, from what I remember of this website, you could make other friends and talk with them quite easily. My family only had one main computer at that point, so after school, I would often have to wait until my mum, dad or brother were finished using it so that I could play. I met a lot of people on there that I became friends with, and eventually, I met Candy. Candy told me she was an eight-year-old girl, and we would spend hours talking almost every single day. It was a harmless online friendship, or so I thought, because again, I was young and naive. One day, Candy asked where I live. I told her Canada. She then asked which county and city, so I told her. I thought she was just curious. Thankfully, she never asked my address, and I didn't give it to her. A few weeks later, Candy told me she was traveling to my city and wanted to hang out. So I asked my parents, and they were obviously very weirded out and concerned by this, so they decided to start reading our conversations. I never understood why. I chalked it up to them being overprotective parents. Candy eventually told me she was in my city, and asked if she could meet me at the park by my house. First of all, since I never told her the area I lived in, I wasn't sure how she knew I had a big park by my house, but I also thought that maybe she just assumed there were parks in every neighborhood. She then said that we could meet by the ice skating rink, 
but she wanted me to walk there alone. My parents read this and flipped out. Our neighborhood is the only one with an ice rink in my town. My parents freaked out at me and thought I told this stranger my address, but I promised that I had not, and eventually they were able to read all our messages and can see that I didn't. Nonetheless, my parents were concerned. They had no idea who this person was or how they figured this out, so they banned me from talking to her. I was upset, but I obliged. After about a year, I had outgrown the website and was on new things. My family had planned a trip to Las Vegas, and we went. While we were staying there, I was really bored in my hotel room and decided to check on how my monster was doing. I logged on to see hundreds of messages from Candy. Don't you want to see me? How could you ignore me? I thought we were friends. Mainly things along that line, until one message stood out. It was a few days earlier, and it read, I know you're in Vegas. I live here. Let's hang out. Just get away from your parents. I was shocked. How could she know? I hadn't logged into the website for a year. I was a kid and had zero social media, and it just didn't make sense. Again, I showed my parents, and they were freaked out and basically banned me from the website in general. I never logged in again, or spoke to Candy again either. Some things are best left that way. This took place back in 2016, when Pokemon Go first launched and took the world by storm. I had downloaded the game and was instantly addicted, so in the middle of this I went to my dad's game shop. He was set up in a place that was only really open on the weekends, but we had some business there during the week. So to pass the time I started up my game, figured I could at least get a few catches while I was there. When I started it up, I noticed there was a Pokestop about a 10 minute walk from my dad's store. Awesome, even still in the plaza. I let him know where I'm going and head out to spin it. I go back and forth a few times, spinning and heading back and my dad doesn't complain as I'm actually getting some exercise for a change. I go back one last time and get my spin. I notice there's a large van nearby. I didn't really note it too much at first. The place was open during the weekends with more permanent shops available to rent but it wasn't uncommon for shop owners to come by to check on things during the week, like my dad did. I get my spin, walk off, and the van immediately starts to drive out. I get a bad feeling and quickly head back to my dad's shop. The way the place was set up as there are multiple roads, if they wanted to leave, they would just continue down that one that they were on and circle their way out. So I made a quick turn around on one of the smaller paths. Of course, they followed me down the road, Despite literally being minutes away from my dad's shop, I'm panicking a bit. I exit out the game, and I'm about to call him. Thankfully, by some miracle, the owner of the plaza appears in his car, excitedly asking me what team I'm on. We talk for a bit, and I'm grateful there's someone I know. I look and can see the van in the reflection of the owner's vehicle in front of me. Now, to all of those who thought maybe I was overreacting in this situation, that may be it was a coincidence. This will show you it wasn't. As I looked and saw them beginning to back up in the reflection, after they made it all the way to the road they'd turned from, I glanced back, noticing they had parked themselves back at the poker stop again. I bid the owner farewell as he drove off, didn't bother to tell him what happened, and while it was helpful to get these guys off my back, he would have done nothing. Garbage like this happens all the time, and he refuses to call police. I immediately get on the phone with my dad, and keep him on the entire time, jogging back the last little bit. I tell my dad what happened, and he said I probably shouldn't go back there during the week. I agree. So to the people in the van, let's not meet. One time I had been at my local Walmart, and smelled a foul stench. I turned my head in the direction of said odour, and there was an elderly man far too close for comfort. He was breathing very shallow, with his feeble-looking hand stretched out towards my face. I quickly moved aisle, as I heard what sounded like grunting behind me. He was attempting to follow me, but from the look, he was far too slow. I was obviously spooked, so I quickly made my way to self-checkout and began to ring up all my items so that I could get the hell out of there. I didn't see this man anywhere so I figured maybe he thought I was someone else, or maybe he had suffered from dementia or something. I forgot about what had happened by the time I got home. Now, out of my mind, I unloaded my minivan, then took a shower and got situated. You know, the usual. 
My dog started barking profusely for some reason, and my mind immediately jumped to the thought of the old man, but I didn't see anyone or anything. Later that evening, I went to check my mail, since I had forgotten it days earlier. As I reached for my hand in there, there were dentures, dentures in my mailbox. I threw them across my lawn and scurried inside. I secured all the locks of my house and called my friend, who thought I was tweaking. She got there and I showed her the dentures on the lawn. She thought I was playing with her. The night continued, everything was normal, and nothing odd happened. She left the next morning, and I took my dog on a walk. Down the street at the library, on a bench, sat the old man. He smiled and a few of his teeth were missing, in the exact same spot as the dentures. He started yelling to me about how I was doomed to go to hell, how I'm Lucifer's wife, and began to run at me, this time much quicker than at the store. Luckily, there was a librarian at the window who called the police. The man was on the run and had a warrant for his arrest for possession of indecent images of underage minors, an aggravated assault on a minor of a sexual nature. He was on the local registry. I really hope he was put away and in a position where he can't harm anyone else. I was 16 at the time of this event. It was 1986, in Indianapolis, at Union Station. I think it was around Christmas time or right after. My mom, two-year-old sister, and 21-year-old uncle were there and visited together. Uncle still lived in Indianapolis, and we had moved to southwestern Indiana at the time. My mom, baby sister, and I were getting ready to leave and drive back home. I'd already bundled up in my coat, scarf, and gloves, and it was getting hot inside Union Station. My mom, God rest her soul, could talk a dead man back to life, so I was waiting for her long-winded wrap-up. I told her I was getting too hot and was going to step out for a minute. My mom nodded her acknowledgement, and out I went. It was cold, but not too bad. No snow, nor wind, just perfect to cool down from being overheated from being inside, but not wanting to play the on and off again game with my coat and other winter wear. Bear in mind I was 16. If this were to happen to me today at 53, things would have gone much differently. I was always a polite kid, almost to the point of being docile. I was always apologetic if I thought I'd screw up in any way. So, not even a minute or so after standing outside, right by the double doors that served as an entrance and exit, a white Chevette pulls up, with two big dudes with crew cuts just sitting in the driver and passenger seats. They were at least 6'5", probably 200 to 80 pounds each, and I figured they were probably from our local fort with the crew cuts, but that was just an assumption due to my family's military service history. Immediately after seeing me, they stop at the curb, roll down the window and smile. Hey, come here, we want to talk to you. I being 16, and now just realising what this looked like, apologetic instead of alarmed, I looked up and saw the incandescent streetlight burning above me. Looked at both of them with a typical apology saying, I'm sorry, this isn't what it looks like. My poor mind was reeling with, great, they think I'm a hoe more so than actually thinking I may be in a dangerous situation. They kept reiterating that they just wanted to talk with me. I kept explaining that this isn't what it appeared to be, and that I apologise if I gave off the wrong impression. It wasn't dawning on me in my embarrassment that they weren't listening to a word I was saying at all. All of a sudden, a passenger gets out and starts moving rather quickly towards me, looking like an alpha wolf staring at a T-bone steak. The switch was immediate, if not only him but myself. I was no longer apologetic and I was no longer embarrassed. I was pissed. You don't have to get your car if you just want to talk to me. I can hear you just fine. I'm normally docile and quiet, but the Irish and Scandinavian side of me came out in full force. I bolted inside where mum was still yammering and upon seeing me, she and my uncle were alarmed because seeing my family again, drove home the fact that I didn't think I'd see them ever if he'd have got me in that car, and I was shaken. I told my mum what happened, and my uncle asked what were they driving. I told him a white Chevette, and mum yelled for him to get them. As he bolted to the door, he ran five to six miles a day. Mum was livid, but I could tell my baby sister was getting scared, so I tried to calm her down. 
My uncle came back a few minutes later, winded and worn out. When he caught his breath, he said he caught up with them at a stoplight and made a move towards their car, but the light turned green. Well, that ended our little Wally World trip, and back home to southwestern Indiana we went. The moral of the stories: don't let manners supersede your safety. Who wants to die for being polite? When I was 21 and booked my first solo trip to Berlin, a foreigner asked me to snap a photo of him on the Christmas market. It was around 8 p.m., which was already dark as hell in Germany for December. Naive, I agree. No spot was good enough for him, so he asks me to take it over there in a darker, more empty spot several meters behind the booths. I get a weird gut feeling. The phone he hands me is at least 10 to 15 years old, with those crappy 2 megapixel cameras. I gave him the benefit of the doubt, let myself be led away to the spot he wanted, and the second I place myself in front of him and open the camera on his phone, three other guys, in each direction, and me in the middle of them, jumped out. My gut told me to look up from the camera. The second I see them coming towards me, I drop the phone and run. I had to go a good hundred meters until I'm back in the crowd and look back at the guys who are all just staring at me, not talking to each other, and not mad I dropped the phone or anything. Just silent stares. I disappear into the crowd and catch the next train back to my hotel. For all I know, they probably wanted to kidnap, murder, or do something worse. Right around high school graduation. I was sitting in the living room at 1 or 2 a.m. when I saw headlights and heard a thud. I cracked the front door and there was a car outside. It appeared as though they may have hit my truck. As I began to open the door, they sped off. I checked the truck the following morning, but nothing looked obvious. I went to work at my cashier job, and my co-workers were talking about armed robbery and a taxi driver that was executed with a handgun overnight. Pretty scary, I thought. About a month later, one of my mum's friends, who happened to work for the county, asked me to look at my truck very closely and call her if I found anything. I told her later that after close inspection, yes, there was a small crack to the plastic trim around the driver's side tail light, and I told her about the car that probably did it. She explained to me that detectives had arrested a group of teenagers while investigating the cabby murder, and that during the interviews they mentioned stealing a car and bumping into a truck while joyriding before robbing a gas station at gunpoint and executing a taxi driver. About two weeks ago, my wife and I had friends over, and someone mentioned a Facebook story about a cabby getting robbed at gunpoint. Someone else mentioned the execution, so I shared my story. My wife then added that we both could have died that night because she was at the gas station when the clerk got robbed. I knew that something bad happened to her around that time, and that she never talked about it much. So it's a scary and odd coincidence to me and her, even though we both weren't together physically at that time. We were both in the path of the same violent crime spree, and any other course of action during that time. Could have resulted in the death in either, or both of us. I was on a bike ride with my friend through an apartment complex. We had gone there about five times and knew it quite well. There were two things weird about it. First, there was this man who had his phone to his face like he was on speaker, but never said anything. He always watched us as we cycled past. When he noticed a spot we usually rode, he stood in our way, like literally would walk to where we rode and stand. This may have been because we rode street on BMX, but I don't think so. Then one day we got split up, one of my friends with me and the others on his own. We rode around looking for my other friend, but couldn't find him. Eventually we found him. He was biking towards us fast. We slowed down and asked where he was. And he said that a guy had been found following him in a truck. He was quite shook up, and someone called the police. They arrived and could not find the truck, and nobody thought of mentioning the man. We never saw the man with the phone or truck again, and we never returned to the complex. When I was around ten or eleven, 
I was home alone. The doorbell rang as I was watching TV, so I hastily moved my bowl of cereal and got up to answer the door. It was the mailman who said he had gotten a package, but it was so big that he needed help carrying it. Something felt off about him, as he wasn't wearing a uniform but a dirty white shirt and jeans. I asked him where his truck was because I didn't see it parked out front and he said it was around the corner and to just follow him and grab the parcel. He kept telling me to go with him but I politely said I wasn't feeling well and that we would just get our mail from the post office. He said how much of a hassle that would be and just go out there and get it with him now. I said I had to get my shoes on from upstairs and he waited outside. I locked the door, bolted upstairs and closed all the windows and called my mum to come home and explained everything. The man was still outside as he shouted at me, asking if I'd gotten my shoes. I replied that my mum was coming over because she was stronger and could help carry the package. Once I said that, he was quick to run and I never saw him again. They never caught him, and I hoped that he never lured any kids and tricked them into going into his van. So to the creepy mailman, let's never meet again. Last April, my boyfriend's friend was throwing a party. The party hall they were using was in a not-so-nice part of town. There was mega drug deals and gang activity close by. The event was formal, so I wore a dress. It may have been too tight or flashy. Of course, my boyfriend wanted to go walk to the QT down the street because he got bored of the party. On the walk back, I noticed a very sketchy-looking male staring me down. I figured I'd just ignore it, because we were almost back anyway. The party hall was actually two that shared the same bathroom area. It was just a little hallway that connected them, and on both sides had doors, so you only saw who went into the bathroom. Once we got back, we were in the line for food, which was right next to the bathroom hall door thing. The door creaks open, and I look over and it's the guy who was staring me down earlier. He whispers something inaudible. Not thinking, I leaned a bit closer to try and understand him. He then reaches his hand out and whispers, Come, look at this with me, and attempts to grab me. I immediately jump back and try to get my boyfriend's attention, and when my boyfriend looked over, the doors closed abruptly. I don't know who the guy was, but I know that if I let him grab me, I'm sure nothing would have gone well. This happened in the summer of 2017, Tallinn, Estonia. My sister and I, both Americans in our early 20s, were on a trip at the time to Estonia and Latvia. I definitely want to preface this by saying that Estonia was one of the most interesting, amazing places I have ever been to, and I'd highly recommend traveling there over any tourist traps in Western Europe. But anyway, we had been exploring the city, which is beautiful for the past few days, and it was our last night in Tallinn before we caught the bus to Latvia the next day. I had wanted to check out the LGBT bars in each city. I'm a gay girl, my sister is not, and decided on our last night we'd go there. Unfortunately, that happened to be a Thursday, so we got all dressed up to go, pre-gamed a bit and headed out to the bar. When we got there, it was completely empty except for the bartender, an unfriendly old Russian woman. So my sister and I decided to just hang out there for a while and order a drink each. Figured that since we were there, we may as well just chill. The drinks were cheaper by US standards, at four to five euros a piece, and I got an amaretto on the rocks. So at some point, this older guy in his late 50s or early 60s came and sat at the bar. I had been in a comfy chair in another room, sipping on my amaretto, as my sister and I decided to explore the area, and I just happened to be in a different one at the time. But meandered back to the bar to chat with my sister, as she was in an armchair in the corner, and I chose the bar stool closest to her. Unfortunately, that also happened to be the seat next to, or a few seats from, this guy who came in. At some point, and I can't remember how exactly, he began talking to me with a heavy Russian accent and spoke very, very little English. I figured he was an older gay man just trying to make conversation with a foreigner. Harmless, right? So I started chatting with him, 
me being somewhat buzzed and generally more gregarious and less guarded than usual. Unfortunately, being tipsy, I had forgotten that at least in the Baltics, gay bars are billed as being for LGBT people and open-minded, aka LGBT-friendly, hetero people. Also, that guy could have been bisexual. So this guy told me his name was Eagle, and we had a very slow, stilted conversation due to him not knowing English and me not knowing Russian. Apparently he was visiting from the city of Rostov, which is in the southwest part of Russia. The hometown of Andrei Chikatilo, not a good sign. Anyway, we had been trying to talk for a while, and then he said, young American woman. I thought it was kind of weird, but chalked it up to him using some of the few English words he knew. In any case, it was getting a little late, and I was looking for a way to politely escape. I told my sister I was going to go to the bathroom really quick before we left. So I went downstairs, and there was only one multi-stall bathroom. At least I could see. I forget whether it was marked women's or just gender neutral. So I went in, and when I came out of the stall, there he was, right in the area outside the stalls, wandering over to the sinks. I had no idea he'd followed me down, so I was pretty weirded out at this point, but not enough to run. I washed my hands, and he was between me and the door, and kept trying to chat. And then... He began repeating, young American woman, over and over a few times. Fortunately, at that moment, my sister appeared outside the door and called me to go. And that proved the perfect opportunity to escape. She had seen him follow me downstairs and thought to check up on me to make sure I was okay. Had she not been there, I don't even know what would have happened. Probably nothing good at all. So we hightailed it out of there, but for a last very creepy twist, as we were walking away from the bar, and we were a decent distance away, we looked back and saw Igor leave too. We practically ran for our Airbnb, and he was never to be seen again. We left for Latvia the next day, and had a great rest of our trip. Personally, I think there was a very good chance he wanted to kidnap us, or worse, and I'm glad I didn't have the misfortune of having to find out. This happened when I was 18. I was going to meet my friend at a local school to skateboard and just hang out. My friend said he might not show up because he had a headache, but told me to go ahead and he'll text me if he's coming or not after. That's the only reason I went. I live right across the border from the US in Canada, and we have smog right now because of the wildfires in California. So that made everything a bit more scary. I was taking a quick break on my phone when a kid with a backpack on walks up to me and says hello. I didn't know if he was talking to me, so I said, Pardon? He casually responds that he was just saying hello and walks past me. He says to have a good day and leaves around the corner of the school. I thought that was the end of it and just got an okay, probably just social kid vibe. Honestly, I wish I was wrong. Not even 10 minutes pass when this kid comes around the corner he first came from last time. I had set up my phone to film a trick, so I actually got the first minute and a half of our interaction on tape. Only my feet and board are visible, but you can clearly see him. Because the smog, everything was pretty fuzzy, and it looked like he came out of nowhere. So I got a bit scared when I noticed him. The next part is just our conversation. Hey, I walked around the whole school. We're the only ones here. He said that while looking directly at me. Yeah, makes sense, you know, COVID and the smog, not too many people around, I guess. Yeah, I want to check, not even kids with their parents. It put me on edge a bit. Everything he said seems really thought out and was said in a very creepy tone, almost like he wanted me to know we were completely alone. At this point, I picked up my phone and the video was still recording. This made me feel safer in case something happened. He then sits down in front of me, takes off his backpack, puts it in front of him and unzips it. He takes out one of those metal sticks you have to put together by screwing each part together and takes out a silver mask. If you've seen Money Heist, it looked a bit like the Salvador Dali mask, but all silver and with just a moustache being black and then lays them out in front of him all while staring at me. Do you know about gangs? I'm not in one, so I don't know that much about them, but I know they exist. 
Do you know about Poco gangs? I live in a city named Poco, and we have a specific gang here. Like I said, man, I'm not into gangs, so I wouldn't know too much about them because I don't associate with them. You know, Poco gangs wear masks like this, and they use sticks like this to attack people. I actually got him asking me about gangs on video, and replying. I'm standing with my phone in hand at the end of the video, and I text to call my boyfriend saying that there's a kid here asking me about gangs and that I'm a bit scared. The call is going and my boyfriend can hear our conversation but doesn't respond knowing that he should just hurry over as he lives a few minutes away. He pulls out from his back what I know is a golf divot, which is easiest to explain as a two-pronged sharp thing that fixes grass in golf. I didn't know what it was and just saw a metal and sharp object. I took a step back and moved towards my stuff, which was a few feet to my right. Are you leaving? Are you scared? I'm just gonna grab my stuff, bro. He drags the divot along the ground and says, This is how you make it sharper. Yeah, they sharpen knives like that too. It's sharp. He then made an almost stabbing motion with it as he said that, and I move away a bit, being genuinely scared he's gonna do something and put my board between us. Are you leaving? Are you scared? If anyone is around me and has something sharp while I'm talking to them about gangs, I'm going to keep away, mate. He threw the divot back in his bag and mockingly said, There, I'll put it away. It's just golfing. Jeez. I'm just concerned about my own safety, dude. I put my stuff in my pockets and he once again asks if I'm leaving. Do you want me to go? Nah, I just want to talk and sit with you. At this point, my boyfriend walks around the corner that's behind me and I see fear in the kid's eyes. My boyfriend is six foot, while I'm five foot three, and is wearing a hoodie with his hood up. He did look intimidating, and it made the kid back off. Do you know him? Yeah, he was supposed to be here like 20 minutes ago. My boyfriend walks up to me, and pretends he was just late to hang out and puts his arm around me. Is that your older brother? Then he looks at the kid and says, Nah, I'm his boyfriend, and kisses my forehead. We start to leave and say bye to the kid who looks at me and says, I'll see you later. Yeah, I don't know about that. I was creeped out and scared, and I'm saying random stuff just to leave. My boyfriend and me turn the corner and start walking when we realize he's following us. He had the mask on and is dragging the metal stick on the cement. It's making a really loud noise as everything else was really quiet. There was in fact no one around. My boyfriend walks me to the playground and finally, people started showing up. A family with their kids, a lady walking their dog, and a guy smoking near the forest. My boyfriend and me went to the corner store, and I fill him in on what happened, and that he came perfectly in time. We buy some random stuff, and go back to his house where his friend is hanging out and waiting for him. We tell his mum, who informs us, there has been a non-emergency call to the local police station, of a kid hanging out in people's yards for no reason and says we should call them too to let them know in case it's the same kid and because he had a dangerous weapon. We drive back to the school to see if he's there. He was and was with the guy who was smoking. I called the non-emergency police line and got an automated message saying they're either closed or can't take any more calls. The next day when I called they apologized and said that it should be 24 seven and not get the automated message. They asked if I had a picture, which I didn't, but I gave his voice and description. And the police said they didn't have much to go on, but would keep a record. But in any case, I hope to not meet that creepy kid again. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories, those of you who listened to the first ones. Really, really dark, really creepy and crazy stuff today. Yes, it's always horrible when uh, people lose their lives in horrible circumstances. Yeah, it's, it's not good. So, my thoughts to those people and their families. I just have no words for that. Bloody hell, some people are the worst. Anyway, if you enjoyed tonight's video, please don't forget to drop a like, leave a comment. Just because it's nice to be, you know, to know that you did a good job, I suppose. I appreciate it, certainly. Um, a huge thank you, as always, to my members and patrons whose names are on screen. And if you'd like your name at the end of every video, 
along with perks and stuff in the post for the next two weeks, all you have to do is follow the link on the top to Patreon. You guys might be getting tired of this now, um, so I'm sorry. But I do hope, sincerely, that you have enjoyed tonight's content. I'll see you on Sunday with a fresh compilation for you guys, and then new stories on Tuesday. Got an interesting mix on Tuesday, so be sure to tune in for that. It's actually really fun and already out. Well, published. It took scheduled to be published. So it should come out at a reasonable hour. All right then, guys. Stay awesome. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.